Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. This episode is sponsored by handweaving.net, the comprehensive weaving website with more than 75,000 historic and modern weaving drafts, documents, and powerful digital tools that put creativity in your hands. Now it's simple to design, color, update, and save your drafts. Handweaving.net's mission is to preserve the rich heritage of handweaving and pass it down to you. Visit handweaving.net and sign up for a subscription today. This episode is sponsored by Trainway Silks. You'll find the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. Choose from a rainbow of hand-dyed colors. Love natural? Their array of wild silk and silk blends provide choices beyond white. Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Marrow. Leslie Rinchen Wangmo is a textile artist working in a Tibetan tradition. She practices a form of applique used to make art for Buddhist spiritual practice. She recently published a book, Threads of Awakening. Leslie, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me, Anne. So the first time I came across your work was when I read about your your book called Threads of Awakening. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about the book and and what it's all about? Well, the book is part memoir, my personal story, and part the story of a very rare Tibetan Buddhist art form that I studied uh, in India. And uh, I initially thought I was writing a book about the art form and realized that my access to the form is through my direct contact, my making the art, my having lived with the Tibetans and learned the art. And I also realized as I showed my artwork that people were often fascinated by the story of how someone from California ended up in the foothills of the Himalayas learning this rare art. So it became both. It became both my story and the art story. And the art form, I, I don't want to mispronounce it, but can you tell me about the art form you're talking yeah, about? that's good to have that hesitancy because people do often <laughs> mispronounce it because it's a particular transliteration system. But it's Tanka. It's usually spelled T-H-A-N-G-K-A. And most Tankas are paintings. It's a Tibetan uh, form of spiritual art, usually the the image, the imagery in it is figurative, um, embodiments of the highest qualities that we want to cultivate as human beings. So they're idealized humans, in a sense, idealized um, beings that embody pure compassion, pure wisdom, energy of enlightenment. So most of them are paintings, and they're framed usually in brocade fabric. But there is a rarer ancient form, it's since at least the 15th century, that is made from pieces of fabric stitched together by hand. And the techniques are really unique to this tradition. Uh, and that's what, um, that's the form that I learned when I lived in India with the Tibetans. So does the word refer to the subject matter or the finished object or a little bit of both? I think a little bit of both. I have heard people say that tanka means something that rolls up. I don't find any real validation for that interpretation when I've looked into the etymology. But basically, tankas are um, two-dimensional artworks that can be rolled up like a scroll. Right? So they're hung on the wall and they can be rolled up, as opposed to wall paintings or sculptures. And generally, they have a spiritual content. Sometimes it's historical figures, but even when it's historical, it's usually the history of the Buddhist teaching lineage. So it's still a, of a spiritual content. Um, sometimes it's some um, great lamas, spiritual teachers, but often it's these idealized figures that represent different aspects of our being um, fully awakened, brought to their fullest. So this is a kind of a rare art form. How did you get involved with it? It is a rare art form. And it's so rare that when I first discovered it, which I'll tell you in a minute how that happened, 
I went back to my community of Tibetan painters and other people involved with Tibetan culture who I was living with, and several of them had never even heard of it. So it is quite rare, even among the Tibetans. I was living in Dharamsala, India, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. I had, tr- I had take- set off to travel, thinking I was going to travel around mostly Asia, maybe other places for about a year. And I had arranged to volunteer for what I thought would be a few months with the Tibetans in exile, the Central Tibetan Administration in India. And I got there and felt completely at home from the first day. It was a very strange, surprising feeling. So I had, after a few months, I'd kind of settled in and knew I was going to stay through the winter at least. And I was working for the planning council, which was uh, dealing with economic development and other aspects of service to the community. And so I was asked to go on this economic development tour of traditional arts and crafts centers among the Tibetan exile community. So I was just along for the ride, going into these different workshops and everything, and we walked into this workshop where a group of uh, young Tibetans were sitting around a big table. Um, They were all sitting on the floor. The table was very um, low. And they were stitching little pieces of fabric. And then I looked over in one corner of the room, and the, the master was there putting pieces together and creating this fantastical creature that I... I didn't know what it meant or anything, but I knew it had to do with the Buddhist teachings. And I had already been, while I was volunteering, I was also studying Buddhism, studying Tibetan language. And before I got there, I had done some quilting. So it was like, I looked down at this thing and it was like all these different threads of my life came together. And <laughs> and I just, I, it was like I fell in love and I was um, kind of speechless. I, I, I just little paralyzed for a moment and um, and then we had to go on because we were doing this economic development tour but when I went back to um, the library where I was living I started asking everybody I said I just really want to learn this and like I said many of the Tibetans had never heard of it or seen it but I found a friend of mine who was a Tonka painter who did the paintings said he had a friend who did the stitching work and so that friend also was interested in learning English so we started off trading and then it went from there. Now you mentioned that you had done a little bit of quilting before but this seems very different from the kind of applique that I typically see in quilting. It's very different. It's very different and the techniques are not like any of the techniques I had learned. While it's often referred to as Tibetan applique, that's the most commonly used uh, English word, or French word, I guess. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, It's not applique as we know it from from quilting and other, other traditions that we know, or at least that I'm familiar with. Because as I understand applique, normally you have a base, a ground fabric, and then um, you apply pieces to that. You put things on top of it and so stitch them on in one way or another, depending on the, the particular method. In this case, it's more like a patchwork because there is no ground. There's just overlapping edges. So each piece overlaps the one next to it and they interlock and create this whole image of pieces. Um, little like a jigsaw puzzle or like I said a little like a patchwork but not with regular seams instead it's overlapping and the other difference is that each piece is outlined with a a kind of piping or cord that I make or the artist the Tibetan applique artist makes by wrapping strands of horsehair with silk thread and then couching those cords to the fabric with the same silk thread so the stitches meld into the the piping, in a sense. So what's the order of operations? How do you go from having an idea to having a finished piece? Mm, Okay. Well, you start with a drawing, and the drawings will be similar to the drawings that they would traditionally use for the Tanka paintings, Uh, tend to be, they have to be different in subtle ways because whereas in painting you can kind of leave something open and fade off into nothingness, with this fabric you have to have an edge. So the drawing has to respect that. 
drawings of these idealized images of compassion and wisdom and such are, are drawn according to traditional proportional schemes. So they're not copied one to the next. Each drawing is an original, but it's an original within a traditionally defined schematic framework. Um, and this is primarily to respect the meditational practices that are based on these um, images. So in order for the images to have some sort of regularity and to con con, um, conform with the teachings and the te instruction text, they keep this proportional scheme. So you start with that, the drawing that's done to the proportional scheme. And then, but the drawing never becomes part of the piece. It's not like the painting where you draw on canvas and then fill in. The drawing is just a map and a template. So from the drawing, I would select the range of colors, um, stabilize the fabrics. So stabilizing the fabrics traditionally was done by rubbing raw meat on the back of the fabric. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you work with what you have, you know? You, <laughs> so in, um, in Tibet, <clears throat> that was often what was used and the grease kind of coats the back and then you apply a hot iron or something it smooths out and it gives the fabric some body so it's not just draping and fall you know um, so I don't do that I use a mixture of methyl cellulose and acrylic medium that um, after a lot of experimentation and, and a lot of funny stories in the workshop all the different things that were tried uh, that, that's what I've settled on as most effective. You could also use um, uh, iron-on interfacings. Uh, the, you know, there's pros and cons of every, of every option. But anyway, stabilize the fabric so that it's not too floppy. And then from the drawing, little, every little segment of the drawing, every little area of, you know, if you've got a, a robe, a, a cloth that's turning different ways, you've got the front and the back, those are each separate pieces of the drawing, each separate segments. So I transfer those um, using pattern transfer paper to the different colors of fabric. Uh, then, so, and then you have a line drawing basically on your fabric of just segments of the, of the overall drawing. Mm. Uh, and then I wrap the horsehair with the thread to make the piping. Uh, and you can do that by hand. You can just hold the ends of the hair and the ends of the thread together and just spin it <laughs> and then you use your, so you spin it with your dominant hand and you use your other thumbnail basically to guide uh, and to keep, keep the tension on the thread so it wraps around the horse hair. Um, and then basically using a large eyed needle for the cord, the wrapped horse hair, and a very fine needle for the sewing thread, which is the same thread that I've wrapped around the horse hair, um, I pull the, the cord through the fabric along the lines that I've drawn, and then use the finer thread to, the finer needle and thread to couch, to make loops, to fasten that cord all along the line. So the lines can curve and they have points. And the reason that horsehair is so great is because it can go around those curves. It doesn't flop around and wiggle like just a, ordinary thread um, and it can be folded into really sharp points and then so all along there couching and making it all fine then I cut out the pieces with a little bit of margin outside the cord line fold the edges under iron them under and then go back to the drawing and use the drawing this time as a, a map to assemble the different pieces. So everywhere there's always an overlap and the um, a cord outlined edge of a piece will cover up a raw edge of another piece. And, um, and then again using the same couching stitch go over the lines again but this time uh, it's attaching pieces together not just attaching the cord to the single piece of fabric. I hope that's clear. It's hard um, it's, it's hard with audio only in a sense, I think, to, to grasp these um, movements and descriptions. And I believe that we actually have a, some technique information from you in an upcoming Piecework magazine. Is that That's right? That's correct. Yes. Yes. So that would be an opportunity for people to try it out for themselves. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm just so interested in, you know, you learned a very traditional way of doing this. And there are some parts that you've adapted for your life and some parts that you've kept the same. 
What did you decide to keep versus what to adapt or transition? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I tried as best I could to discern which things are done. For example, the proportions of the draw of the images are done for a purpose that has to do with the function of the piece spiritually, its impact on the viewer or how it's going to be used in because they're used sometimes to guide meditation practices. So in a sense, uh, in making the images, I'm a, 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 a translator of teachings, you know, so I have to translate accurately. So in those cases, I, there's a reason to stick to something because it's conveying the, the, critical, the crucial essence of, of the value of the work, you know, and the purpose and the function. There are other times where things were done because it was, it worked in a particular context and we're not in the context anymore. So I try to distinguish between things that have a, you know, a, an enduring function and things that were done because they work. And so I should do what works. And so that's like the meat stabilizing the fabric that worked in a high altitude, dry, cold climate. It didn't work very well in India, where it was more humid and it was just a different place. And it doesn't work very well for my sensibilities as a person who prefers not even to eat meat. And also we have other options. We have other options. So it's like, what was the purpose of that? The purpose of the meat was to give the fabric some body. So I found something that would fulfill that function that better fit the context. On the other hand, another uh, technical thing that um, some people changed, and I actually went back to the traditional, but again, because it worked, is um, <laughs> the horsehair. So I wrap horsehair with silk thread to make these lines because I it has just the right amount of malleability and integrity, I don't know if that's the right word, but so some Tibetan applique, contemporary Tibetan applique artists use um, monofilament, nylon fishing line. And it's not bad. It's not, it's not bad. It can do the job somewhat. However, horse hair or any kind of hair, ha hair isn't smooth. If you look at hair under a microscope, it's not really smooth. It has little scales or barbs or crevices, you know. And, and so when I wrap silk thread around it and the, the fibers of the silk are very fine, they kind of hold on to each other. If you try to wrap monofilament with silk thread, it's just gonna fall off, it's not gonna hold. So you need to use an adhesive. You need to add in an adhesive. So that's already like, well, is that adhesive, you know, is it gonna yellow, is it gonna change, is, you know. And also, the nylon, on some curves, it has the right amount of body, but it doesn't like to curve back the other direction. It's like fine if you're just going in a circle, but it doesn't like to do um, undulating curves or sharp points. It kind of um, has a muscle memory almost, and it doesn't want to be moved around. So that was a case where some you know, more modern people were using this new fangled monofilament nylon fishing line, and I went back to the traditional because it works better. It works better. So are you talking about an individual horsehair at a time? Usually three. That's still not <laughs> very big. <laughs> no. and That's still pretty <laughs> fine. <laughs> and actually a single one, a single strand of horsehair when it's um, the lines around eyes, you know, of the faces of these figures. So where it's very, very fine lines or sometimes fingertips. Uh, it's only one strand, but most of the lines, it's three strands. And yeah, it's fine. But, and even, you know, one of the other interesting things working, the difference working with monofilament compared to uh, horsehair, with the, with the monofilament, you have different gauges. So you choose by the number how thick it is, right? With hair, it's just like our hair. Some of them are coarser and some of them are finer. So when I'm selecting the hairs, I even, I can 
influence the line weight a bit by choosing the finer and coarser hairs. So. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so what kind of other materials do you use? You mentioned using silk sewing thread. You, initially, when you said sewing thread, I thought, well, surely this isn't like polyester no. from Joanne's. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at the, the different colors, how are you you know, choosing your materials. Yeah, it's challenging, I have to say, because I teach an online program called the Stitching Buddhas Virtual Apprentice Program. And the biggest challenge over the years in teaching that program, it hasn't been, I thought at first it would just be hard to teach people without being able to physically guide their hands and show them it, you know, in the moment. But actually, we, we've gotten through that, and people learn very well, uh, even th online. But the real challenge has been the materials, because I have gotten my materials from Varanasi, India, from a couple of families that have been doing business with the Tibetans for generations, and they make the thread and the silk satin and brocade that works just so well for this art form. It's just, they've grown up together in a sense. And we've had a very difficult time identifying available materials in either North America or Europe that work. Um, recently, we found one thread available in Europe from Belgium that, was, that works well, but they don't ship outside of the EU. So that's been a wow. real challenge um, as well. But yeah, so there, it's um, the silk thread that I use, that I get from the, the supplier in Varanasi, is um, it's very, it's two-ply, and it's very loosely twisted. It's loosely spun and loosely plied. I don't know if that's the correct term, terminology, but before I wrap the horsehair, I separate the two strands so it becomes more like flat silk or more like uh, an embroidery floss or something. Because if it's twisted, then as I wrap it around the horsehair, it might have a little bit of ridges. So I want it to be as smooth as possible. But So it's very easy to separate because it's very loosely twisted. We've tried with some commercially available silk threads and it's often very difficult to separate the strands. And if you can't separate the strands and they're tightly wound, then they don't have that nice quality I was talking about where the fibers um, wed with the crevices of the mm -hmm. hair. So it, it is a challenge. It's a challenge, the threads and also the fabrics, um, the silk satin that uh, has been woven specifically for this art form um, by these families in, in Varanasi is, it's like uh, bridal satin or duchess satin, but, you, but that's hard, you know, that's the kind of satin, we can get it in white and ivory and pink. <laughs> Not it's and usually it's polyester. And it's, well, nowadays it's usually polyester, right? And it's right. and it's yeah. also, and if it is silk, it's it's exorbitantly expensive. But yeah, but they make it this um, in all different colors, and um, but it's not easy to acquire. I mean, basically, mm -hmm. the best way is to go and visit and. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're describing is a uh, sort of a you know a culture and uh, suppliers of materials and an art form and uh, you know a religion or a spirituality that have all kind of come together and you were coming from the outside how did you sort of find your way into that you know after after you've discovered that this is something I'd like to learn more about how did you figure out how to you know, navigate your way into that yeah. world. I mean, I think I was just very fortunate, first of all. I have to I have to credit luck uh, um, in some ways. But I also think there must have been something in my demeanor that communicated more than curiosity, like a deeper commitment than I even knew I had at the time. Because, well, I had already been living in Dharamsala for a few, uh, some months before I the first discovery. So I, and I was studying the language. So I spoke a little bit of Tibetan and I was studying Buddhism and I was 
volunteering for their administration. So I think all of that already communicated. It, not, it wasn't a fly-by-night kind of thing, that I was, that I was really deeply interested in, in the culture and that I had some stability in my presence there, you know. And I was living it, at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, and there was also a Tonka painting school there. For the painters, for the more, which is, the painting is the more common form of tanka. Not that it's common, it's gorgeous and beautiful and very fine and very highly skilled artist. But. So I, I had a lot of friends in my community who were tanka painters. And so I mentioned the first one who introduced me to the first teacher who was curious about learning English. So that was an entree, you know, in the end, he wasn't that interested in teaching. So that didn't end up being a long-term teacher-student relationship, but, but it, was, it got me in. And I worked with him for some months and I created some, some little pieces. So he worked on this flower design and I made these little leaves on very simple, you know, cotton poplin or something. So when it was clear that he didn't want to teach anymore and and he had other work to do and just didn't have that much time two things happened i think one is that i it was clear to me then that this was more than a passing fancy that i really wanted to learn i didn't know i would change my whole life and follow this path but i i wanted to learn um so i wasn't just going to let that be something to let go of but also then when another um tanka painter friend um, identified a workshop, an atelier, where um, there were apprentices, there was somebody who wanted to teach, and, and <laughs> um, he, this other friend took me there, introduced me, and at that point I had these little pieces that I'd made. So I already, again, I, I could show that, that I was serious in some way. And so this second teacher, Dorji Wangdu, he accepted me and he actually just said, you can start tomorrow. And I was thrilled, but I didn't know how amazing it was until some months later, because I ended up apprenticing there for four years. And I was the only Westerner. And when other foreigners would come to the door of the workshop, just because they were curious, they wanted to see what was going on, he didn't talk to them. He would send me, he would delegate me to take care of them. <laughs> and I asked him why. And he said that, well, oh, you know, most of these Westerners, they, they just want some quick and easy thing. They're not really going to take the time that it takes to understand this art or to learn with any kind of competence. And so when I heard that, I, I really felt lucky for how he had said, you can start tomorrow. I, you know, somehow having those little tiny flower petals, being introduced by a, tanka paint, a Tibetan tanka painter, having already been there some months and having some of the language. I mean, all of these were signs of, of a real dedication um, that I don't know if I was aware of it, but I clearly had it and he saw it. But I was just very, very welcomed and never, never made to feel like I didn't belong. There's a lot of talk now about various kinds of craft being meditative. Right. And and I think, you know, that sort of either a flow state or, you know, occasionally some sort of mindfulness. But that's that's not like what right. you're talking about with, you know, having, uh, I forget what you said, like the elevated right. beings that are... Right, right. Because, but I mean, that also is at play, right? That also is part of this experience. But um, yeah, you're right. It's... there. They're like icons, you know, they're like Byzantine icons or something, but it's the Tibetan right. form. And it does, it does somewhat endow the work with, a, with just another level or another facet of, of sacredness. So since you have a different background than most of the, you know, Tonka painters or other mm. Tonka artists, do you find that your work is different or is your work different just because you, because each artist's work is different? Yes, and <laughs> both. No, I don't know. Each artist's work is different to some extent. And then there are artists, there are some Tibetan artists, um, contemporary Tibetan artists who have taken the painting forms into they're not doing the sacred art anymore in a sense, but they're taking the images into uh, 
much further out kind of interpretations and combinations than I have. Um, but when we're talking about, let's say, working even in the sacred form, I think I, I think I do bring some different sensibilities of color. My color palette it seems to be different. And I'm not, I don't tend to do as many elaborate traditional background elements, you know, because maybe the tradition doesn't have the same hold on me. It's kind of back to the beginning, what, the earlier question about which things to keep and which things to let go of. And so the figure, which is the embodiment of our qualities, that feels more like something to, that has value for me, that, that there's an enduring thing, whereas the landscapes and things I can let go. And I even had asked some lamas about, and I've seen some artists who put the deities, the, the traditional figures in completely different environments and such. And I had asked some questions about that when I was first starting to do my own work. And I, I consulted with some lamas just to make sure I didn't do anything that was going to be disrespectful. I really have tremendous respect and gratitude to the culture that this comes from. And I don't in any way want to I want to be able to grow with it, but I don't want to offend it or, you know, harm in any way. And so, yeah, they, that's basically what they said is, yes, uh, the, these divine images that are our highest qualities, of course, can manifest in any environment. So, of course, any landscape and elements are fine. But just check yourself. Make sure that it's that you're elevating those qualities. Make sure that, that, that what you're surrounding... I was even going to say you don't want to put them in an ugly environment, but if they're in an ugly environment, but they're above and blessing the environment, then that would be okay. You just the, the, the point is to, to make sure that there's a sense of respect and aspiration communicated in it. So rather than you must do this this way. <laughs> I think part of the reason I'm asking is I'm, I'm remembering a conversation I had quite a while ago with uh, John Marshall, who does a lot of work in the in a Japanese tradition, mm -hmm. and he studied and studied a variety of art forms in Japan. But because his influences and context are Japanese, like yours are kind of Tibetan, yeah. um, sometimes it's a little bit harder for people like me, <laughs> people are, um, you know, kind of American appreciators of, of art and craft mm -hmm. to sort of understand what they're looking at and what the context is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So when you are making these and, and when when the artisans are making them, or, or the artists, I should say, are making them in traditional workshops, are these the sort of things that somebody would have in their home as sort of a, um, a spiritual prompt or, a, you know, the kind of artwork that you can have in your home? Yes. Uh, the paintings in particular. The paintings mm -hmm. are just more abundant. They're more they don't take as long to make and, and they're more mm -hmm. available. There are more people, artists who do the painting. So it's very common for Tibetan families to have uh, at least one and maybe multiple tankas in their home, even if they're not particularly, you know, they don't have a particular formal meditation practice, but just it's a it's an inspiration, it's a reminder, it's a call to their spirituality. The the stitched the fabric form that I do, it would be very rare for someone to have one of them in their home because they were always rarer, and they tended to be made for big ceremonies and so sometimes they were giant size so that thousands of people could see them you know big audience could see them but even if they weren't giant they would be usually un in a temple and unveiled for special occasions so and I think that's just a reflection of that there weren't as many so they're more mm -hmm. um, reserved in a sense but yes that and and I think this thing about the respect, when it's talking about putting the, the divine figure in an atmosphere of respect, I mean, that also applies to the art object itself, that you would place the art object, the tanka, in a position of respect. And, and in a sense, then, not only whatever teachings are communicated in the imagery, but also the, the way of relating to that object evokes 
a kind of aspiration and calls forth the kind of better qualities of yourself to whenever you have something that you res, that you revere in some way that calls forth a different aspect of your beings. So as an as a working artist now, are you mostly working to um, sell your pieces as art? Are you mostly working as a teacher? How How is this sort of fitting into your how is your artistic practice fitting into your life at this point? Well, actually, my my greatest artistic practice of the last few years has been writing the book. So it, it, it's really <laughs> taken. <laughs> writing a book is the biggest project imaginable, I have to say. And then publishing it and promoting it and all of that. It's a it's a huge mm-hmm. endeavor and huge learning. So but in terms of my um, my textile art, my visual art, I do works on commission and uh and i have some pieces also that i've done because i wanted to create them and that they could be available for purchase but but i also teach yes i teach through this stitching buddha's um virtual apprentice program so i don't travel and do workshops i haven't found a good way to make that work it's it feels um you can't get very far in a short time together. What, what I have done in person, so my, so the Stitching Buddhist program is, I call it virtual apprenticeship, but it, it's a six month course to learn the basic fundamentals of the technique and you make a lotus flower in that course. And then beyond that, several students have stayed on with me on a kind of month to month membership basis to advance and eventually make their own tankas. But as you can imagine, I mean, I did a four-year apprenticeship. It, it, you, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. And so with students who are in that online program, I have had annual in-person retreats so that people are already in the learning process. Then you can come together for four or five days and get something done. But in terms of having the, you know, occasional workshops at different levels, I haven't been able to make it work. I know there are a lot of wonderful um, textile technique teachers who do it, but I haven't been able to make it work. It does seem like a very far cry from what, what you were describing about being in a in a workshop, an atelier, where people are, are not only learning, but are, are practicing hands-on. Yes, yes. I mean, we're really creating, we were collaboratively creating these amazing artworks that were, you know, more detailed and complex and larger probably than any of us individually would make. And so we were getting our education while contributing to these huge, amazing artworks. And, um, and it was, it was, yeah, it was lovely because different, depending on your skill level, you know, when you just started, you'd maybe make a flower petal in a cloud. And, <laughs> and then maybe you'd graduate to some kind of offering objects or pieces of the, of the clothing. And then you'd graduate maybe to the arms and the feet and then maybe the hands. And then finally, after years, to the faces and the eyes. And so you could work together because different people were at different levels. Um, that was great. And that I don't, I, we don't really have access to that. Um, in our world. Who were the other f- people who were apprenticing with you? Were there quite a few of them or was it a small group? It was, it grew while I was there. I think when I started that we were only about 10 and I think it was maybe 20 some when I, so he had, the, the workshop, the atelier mm-hmm. grew. Um, they were, uh, they were all Tibetan and they were young people. So I was 32 when I entered the apprenticeship and I was clearly the oldest. So they were probably ranged in age from teenage through their 20s. And they were from all different walks of life. I mean, some were newly arrived refugees from Tibet who'd come into India. Um, and some had grown up in exile in the Tibetan settlements around India and Nepal. And for them, it was, it's a, I mean, it was a, it was a job. It was a, it's like something old fashioned kind of apprentices, apprenticeships in guilds and things because they, they, they received room and board. So it was like going to 
boarding school and getting training and fulfilling a job. And so it, it was a um, comprehensive thing for them. Yeah. So for most of our listeners, you know, stitching is generally something that you kind of do for pleasure, for expression, but not quite to the extent of a formal spiritual practice or an apprenticeship. Do you actually have any fiber crafts that are your side project? Or is this sort of what you do you knit? (laughs) I wanted to for years, you know, but it's always like, I yeah. So recently, actually, I have started doing some sewing of clothing of garments which is Mm -hmm. really kind of ironic because through all the years when I would introduce people I would meet people and say I'm a textile artist and they'd point at something I was wearing and say did you make that and I'd be like I don't make clothes (laughs) (laughs) and but but I actually have been doing that a little um, recently which is fun I'm enjoying it it's a whole different thing but it's funny you ask about knitting because I sometimes I have friends who knit I think oh I'd love to do that and then I'm like are you crazy you're spending already hours a day sitting and stitching you do not need to do another sitting and (laughs) stitching or moving needles or anything like that when I when I'm not sitting and stitching I should be out taking a walk or (laughs) so I (laughs) I I, am yes so I I so I don't really when I'm very actively doing my form of Uh textile artwork I really don't do anything else but I think Uh um in a sense having completed the book it feels to me like I've completed a circle in some way. I've completed an assignment even. And I'm, who knows who gave me this assignment? But I feel like in some way, this is this strange, wonderful life assignment that I've had, as well as a gift that I received from the Tibetans. And the book is both a repayment of, you know, my gratitude, my debt of gratitude to the Tibetans, to my teachers, Um, And when I say the Tibetans in general, I mean in the sense of the whole community that has preserved this rich culture, you know, and then my specific teachers as well. But also it feels like it's the capstone on this whole assignment. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do the work anymore, but I don't have to. It's like, I feel like it's, it's kind of come full circle. And so I think that's what's freed me up to make clothes and you know I did a little bit of botanical printing which I'm really curious uh-huh. to do more so I think I'm, I'm entering an experimentation phase and you know I love textiles so it's going to come out in needle crafts and textile work of some sort. So when you started this you had an interest in textiles but your background isn't in art is it? No I just I've been a dabbler in art I, I went yeah I, I went through a period I was going to study architecture and did some study of urban planning, but with a focus on the built environment. So there was drawing involved in that. And then I've dabbled. I painted when I was a child. I did a little quilting like that. But until I met this art form, I didn't completely dedicate myself to art. No. Imagining yourself as an artist or identifying yourself as an artist is a step that I think can be hard for for some people to take. You know, is it is it serious? Is it worthwhile? Well, clearly, if you had an, you know, clearly the work that you did is, you know, a huge body of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still a term. It's, it's a label that I'm not very comfortable with. I mean, I, I, Hmm. I introduce myself. I say I'm an artist. I know that that's what I'm supposed to say. Um, (laughs) And when I try to say that I don't really identify with that, people think I'm being self-deprecating in some way. They say, oh, but what you do is art. And I'm like, that's fine. Yes, it's art. But I, I feel more like a stitcher. I, 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 feel, I feel like a craftsperson and a stitcher. And I don't, I don't know why, but I feel more comfortable with those terms in a way. But I use artists, but it, it's never completely molded to my skin. <laughs> So was it a big change to you from going from working uh, in, a, in a workshop as an apprentice with a big group to pursuing this work on your own? Um, I made it somewhat gradually in the sense that while I was still apprenticing, I started doing projects on my own in, in, the, mm-hmm. in my off hours late into the night. Um, <laughs> and so... 
it was, you know, I reached a point where it was time. And then, and then for the next couple of years, as I worked on my own, I always brought my project back to my teacher to show him. So, so I didn't, there wasn't this sudden break, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think I have a kind of independent solo spirit anyway. So it's mm -hmm. comfortable to me to work on my own. So, I mean, I loved working in the group as well, but I I probably always, there was a part of me that would push away and need to get to my own thing. And that, I think that's a distinction also when you asked about who the other people, the other apprentices were. None of them really intended to go out on their own and make their own artworks. They could stay there and, and be part of the team. And, and like I say, it would be a good job. So even once they became complete, you know, they were completely proficient and weren't really in training anymore, they could still be collaborating and creating these, these artworks and it was a good job and a good living situation. Whereas I, from the beginning, it was clear for me and for my teacher and without any communication, he, he knew, even like, though, like I say, I was never treated like an outsider, it was always understood that there was something different in my life path. And so I was, I was prepared and preparing to, mm -hmm. to work on my own. Have you ever been tempted to use these techniques and skills to make something that wasn't in the general Tonka form? Yeah, yes. And I have done. I have a few pieces, and they're not in the book because the book really is focused on the form. But I have used the techniques um, combined with some quilting and some photography uh, and different kinds of printing um, to make uh, portraits uh, that aren't, so they're not sacred images. But it's, mo up till now, they've still been of that part of the world, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, not for any clear reason, except that there's, I, yeah, there's just a connection. But yes, the techniques, and one of my students has made... Um, a beautiful moth design, a very interesting piece where she, she cultivated some silk and then she's using that along with the Tibetan applique techniques to make a design of a silk moth. It's beautiful, beautiful concept and, and piece. So once you have the techniques, you could use it for any kind of imagery. Yeah. But for me, it's still kind of connected to the culture and the, and the spiritual tradition. Yeah. Do you know if there are still, you know, workshops in Dharamsala that are that are doing this kind of oh, work? Oh yes, yeah, there are. There, there's. Um, I mean, my teacher is not there anymore, but he's still connected, associated with his workshop, and his uh, a relative has taken it over, and there are apprentices there, and there's another one um, next to it, and then there is at least one in um, Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, and there, there are a few in, in India. I mean, there aren't many, many workshops, but there are a few in India and in Nepal. It's interesting. This is, this is so tied with Tibet and the Tibetan culture. And it's essentially a, an art of diaspora in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's hard to know how much it's being continued in Tibet itself. There was a project done probably 10 years ago, or no, maybe 20 years ago, to recreate some giant applique tankas in a part of Tibet. But they weren't, there wasn't, there was no longer an in-house atelier in the temples there. But whether there is now in some temple or monastery in Tibet, I don't know. So I have to ask, because there are not that many people whose books are blurbed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> was he part of that community when you were there in Dharamsala or is he someone who has just a sort of part of that culture? Well, he lived there. That's where he lives. And uh, so um, my the workshop where I apprenticed was uh, just outside the gates of the main temple, mon the monastery that's associated with the Dalai Lama. And then if you went through the sort of 
plaza there, you'd get to the gates of his residence. So it was, you know, five minute walk away from where I was studying. And uh, he taught at the main temple and, you know, crowds of the public would come. And um, every time he departed for uh, foreign or, uh, you know, tours and such, the, the people would line the streets to, you know, to bid him farewell and then to greet him when he came back. So that was very much a part of our lives that, that he lived there. It's not, he wasn't a part of the community in the sense that he's walking in the streets, obviously. Um, but he was very much present, giving teachings regularly, showing up for, you know, major holidays. And as I said, you know, his, the motorcade would come and go. And then I, um, I had the chance to meet with him when I finished my apprenticeship, I requested to meet with him. I had met a couple of times previously in small groups of volunteers. Uh, and then I'd also been, he used to do these public audiences where people would line up, hundreds or thousands of people, and just walk by. Unfortunately, as security got to be more of an issue, that wasn't done anymore but but it, but when I finished my apprenticeship before taking my artwork outside the community I just wanted to have his blessings his advice his you know, counsel so I requested an audience so I did get to meet him then one-on-one -on -one, uh, for about 20 minutes and it was very that was just a, quite a blessing quite a Quite an experience. I write about that in the book, so people can read about it. That is very meaningful as a as a as a blessing, as yeah. a as a step forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, and it made me feel, you know, it just gave me confidence that that there was that it, that what I was doing was um, was respectful and was right minded. You know, that it just it was very important to me to have that. I think that's very forward thinking. You know, I think there are. It's almost impossible to have a, a conversation about traditional arts, traditional non-Northern European mm -hmm. arts, and not have some thought at this point of cultural right. appropriation. And it seems like if 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 one wants to avoid that, how could you go about it any more than apprenticing for eight years and requesting a sign off from the, <laughs> the Dalai Lama. Right, right. And still, when those questions come up, I always question myself again, and I go back, I look up, you know, I, I, I look into the issue, and I, I question myself, and, and I have to regain that confidence, because I recognize I'm a guest, and I've received a gift, and I just want to be careful that I, that I handle it appropriately. So I just love this picture of what it is like to be in any kind of working textile shop, let alone one that's in such a special place. Yeah, I mean, I'm just even thinking, it reminded me as you were saying that, of um, because I, I described how the monastery was right outside and then the Dalai Lama's residence, but also because of that, in the workshop, we were stitching, but we also sometimes would hear the sounds of the ritual instruments used for various ceremonies and then when they had offerings of food you know there some of the ceremonies you offer food and then afterwards it's distributed and so we would get the food that came from these offering ceremonies and um, so it was very integrated with the practice of of buddhism in that culture and so you couldn't even though you were just stitching, you couldn't forget for a moment that you, you were part of something bigger. So I've loved getting just a little snapshot into what it must have been like to learn these techniques. Yeah, it was an amazing Thank you experience. so much for your time. I'm definitely going to look forward to, to checking out your book, which is Threads of Awakening. Thank you very much. I hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks to Trinway Silks and Handweaving.net for sponsoring this episode. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.